All right. Good morning and welcome to the August 17th uh, Joint Concord Carlisle Concord School Committee's meeting. I want to thank all of our members, uh, committee members, who managed to, I know this is a difficult time and some of you are on the road afar um, and thank you for being here, taking some time from delivering children to school and vacations and all that. So I'd like to take a roll call for the Concord Carlisle School Committee. And would you like to open up the Concord School Committee? Yes, meeting? roll call for Concord as well. And I want to note that this meeting is being reported. Correct. Yeah. All right, Anderson present. Booth present. Morano present. Rainey present for both. And Wilson present for region. Thank you. Um, before we begin our public comment, we just want to take a moment to welcome Debbie Dixon, our interim SPED director, who will be joining us. Um, we wanted to introduce, give you a moment to introduce yourself to the community. Um, and, uh, Could she join us here? Yeah. 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 There's a microphone right there. I didn't warn her. So. Oh, <laughs> come on up, Debbie. We'll start. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry I'm like you on the spot. Would you like to take a moment to welcome yourself to the <laughs> <laughs> Sit there for that moment, I say. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give Debbie a minute to settle in and just say how glad we are Debbie's here. She's jumped in willingly and kind of pretty last minute to support us for the year as interim director of student services. She's been here a day, so don't ask anything too grilling as of yet. Um, this will be a nice bridge from Ruth Gruby to whoever's next for us in a year and help us. Uh, you know, have the time to do the search properly. Debbie comes with a really deep level of experience, having just left two years of interim at AB. Um, prior to that, Dover Sherburn, and then in, before retirement, um, and Franklin in Sudbury. You see, she's one of those that doesn't retire well. Uh, so we're really, really glad to have her. She's going to clearly hit the ground running and um, really serve us well for the next year. So welcome. Thank you. You said everything I would have said. Um, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored to be here. And I really look forward to working with you um, on behalf of the students, families, staff um, to work through um, this interim year um, and get ready for the following year. I'm setting you up for success, continued success um, for the students here in Concord and or Concord Carolina. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Everything has been so lovely and welcoming. It's been a day. Yeah. I'm glad we're off to at least that good stuff. Great. So, well. yeah, we do welcome you. The very fact that you're here is one sign that we're in transition. Um, so, we, we have uh, high hopes, high expectations, and we hope to um, match that with a great deal of support for you. Thank but you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Debbie, we won't keep you. Can yes. Back to settling in we're glad you were able to stop over i had a lot of feeding to do I bet you just. <laughs> so thank you it's nice to meet you all yes have a good day. You. thank you thank you right. so now we'll return to our public comments section before we begin public comments just a few notes um one is as we always know this is a school committee meeting in the public not with the public so we welcome and encourage questions, comments, thoughts, and all that, but we will not necessarily engage in a dialogue during the open comment. Um, however, we will be hosting a public forum regarding school return to school plans that will be next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Um, and we encourage you to Either comment will be a webinar format, so you'll have a chance to type in your questions, or you can email your questions in advance to the Concord Carlisle or Concord School Committee uh, through our website links. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we hope that we'll be able to address everybody's uh, questions at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, if anyone has any public comments, please raise your hand in the Zoom. Who's going to be? Who's Aaron? Can Aaron see the? Okay. Aaron, you can just either, uh, yeah, raise your hand through Zoom or raise your hand in person or. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Ashley Healy. I'm a Please give your name and your address. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ashley Healy. I'm at 778 Drive in Concord. I'm a parent and a public, and I'm just here on um, the uh, proposed mass policy. I just want to express support for it and thank you from fellow elementary school <laughs> parents who um, I know are feeling similarly that we would uh, like to see our kids wear masks when school starts in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Do we have any members of the remote audience raising hands? We do. I see someone. I see some videos. Then this little. No, thanks. Thanks. That's what I had before. I know. Do you know the name of the person with hand raised? Hand raised. Bob Lonadier. Bob Lonadier. Yeah, the, hope you can hear me. Uh, Robert Lonadier, 72 Finnegan Way. Um, really, uh, first, a technical comment. Uh, it's very hard to hear what the words are being said in the room. So uh, I hope that there'll be a transcript or something that uh, everyone can follow along better. And uh, also, just a clarifying question you can answer now or later, but I didn't get all the details on the meeting next Tuesday. Uh, so I assume that there'll be a notice sent out for that. It's going to yeah. go out today when the protocols go. Okay. Yeah. It'll, it'll be next Tuesday, 7 p.m. webinar format. Questions can be submitted in advance or in live. Um, and there will be a link sent out later today. So I, I guess just to follow up on that, it, so when you say webinar, is, is there going to be Q&A and dialogue? Because it's the or webinar it be format, more? yeah, because it's the webinar format, we can either promote people to, vis, ver, to come become panelists, or they can do it through the Q&A and type the uh, questions in and we'll answer them. Um, we, have, we have to go with the webinar when we're not sure how many people will show up because the meeting uh, formats can cap out. So absolutely, there'll be Q and A. Thank you. Welcome. And is the is the audio better now? It's okay. It's still a little bit echoey. I just think that people that are on Zoom. It's very clear when someone's on Zoom, like I heard Bob really loud and clear, and it's a little bit um, from the background from you guys. Okay. We will we will do our best from this room. Are there other questions? No, no, okay. With that, we'll move on to the reading of the minutes from the open session joint meeting from June 8, 2021. Can I have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved for both. Both committees. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Roll call. Anderson and I for both. Discussion. Oh, discussion. The, thanks for the corrections. Uh, correction, just one small one. So appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Go call. Anderson, I for both. Who's I for both? Murano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Randy, I for both. Wilson for region. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Correspondence. I have not received any correspondence through the Concord Carlisle. Did you get my test? I have not been your test. Yes, they did get your test. Well, and yesterday, yes. questioning about how to access this screen. Yes. Okay. It might have just been Concord. It might just show Concord. Okay. I did not check that. I should have. Okay. And other than that, from Concord? Nothing. No. Okay. So we can move on to discussion. COVID protocols, August 2021. Here so, we are. So Dr. Hunter suggested that we reverse the, oh. the first two. Okay. Um, just to make more sense to have the face masks 
I'll see clarified and then the rest of the protocols. Okay. Does that that's okay? fine? They're so interconnected. Yes. Um, yeah. And before we do that, I just want to introduce some of the folks with us on Zoom, um, our health leaders. Trisha McGeehan is here as our public health nurse. Lisa Kosky is here as our K-12, pre-K, age 22 lead nurse in the school district. And Susan Rask is the Concord Health Director. And they have been meeting with us regularly in the last few weeks and are here to uh, support us during the conversation of our plans on how to bring school back. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and for all of your work over the past. 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> How many years? Oh, yeah, right. we're getting up there. Then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have um, we looked at our face covering policy from last year, and and Cynthia and I discussed that we should probably revise it somewhat uh, to better reflect our current situation. Um, hopefully, everyone had a chance to review the proposed language of the new policy and um, we hope that it, uh, it it gives us the right uh, balance of, of supports and, and assurances through this year and the uh, latitude to you know adjust us as we need to um, are there any questions from school committee members about this or Laura, would you like to? Yeah, it might be helpful just to summarize the biggest takeaways um, in case anyone hasn't looked at it in the public listening. We are proposing a policy that has everyone in face masks to open school, um, including grades seven through 12, where students are highly vaccinated. Um, that's on an, out of an abundance of caution for not being totally able to predict the Delta variant in the schools, um, given its you know fairly recent recurrence, um, that said, and clearly we're going to mask the elementary K six kids that are not vaccinated, and I expect that will remain in place until the vaccine is available. Seven through twelve, we're leaving with a plan to ongoing check in on how things are. Um, get our own data in front of us. I think that was a big part of our conversation with the health leaders was let's get our local data like we did last year and really understand with the masks what that is going to you know, look like in the schools and what the impact is. And so we are very much wanting to revisit that because if comfort grows and we feel that the vaccine is doing its job um, across the wide ranging percentage of kids and we have that health data to show most of our kids are vaccinated. Um, we may be able to pull back or, or lift the mask requirement as the year goes on. So I think that's the largest takeaway. A lot of the rest is procedural um, and any ways to opt out, of which we've had very little of the last year plus. So I don't expect that to be a big issue. And I just want to stress, this is for all individuals in all school buildings. Yes. So it's for, for visitors, for staff, faculty, yes. students alike. Yes. Everyone. Yep. Regardless of vaccination status, at least to start with. And we will be reviewing this every every two weeks at a minute. Yeah, I think our plan is to put it on the agenda every time we yep. meet with you and um, talk on where we're at. Okay. Great. Are there any questions? I mean, unfortunately, yes. I, I don't want to stir things up. This is difficult enough for everybody involved. I and mean, the compliance on everybody's part for well over a year has been exceptional. And these schools have been able to stay open as a result. And that's our continued goal. However, um, I, I want to put you on the spot, uh, Dr. Hunter, or our, our health uh, experts in the room. We don't call out. Uh, what masks are acceptable here, do we not? So we leave it up to sort of building judgment if uh, something seems to be really deficient and we'd mm -hmm. offer up a, a better surgical mask. Is that practically what would happen? I'll let them weigh in and I'll just remind you that last year, right as we opened, we did not allow the gators to mm -hmm. come in and insisted that it be a, a face mask. So I do you want to weigh in, Trisha or Susan? Would you want us to continue that? Yes, I think we should stare 
clear of gaiters and use either a cloth uh, face mask or a surgical mask. So <clears throat> perhaps reinsert the language. Do we have it in there from last year? Yeah, we can pull it from what we put okay. in last year. I think it's a great suggestion. Yeah, thank you for it. Well, I think it simply makes it easier for mm -hmm. people. We're not trying to be right. onerous. We're trying to be simple and clear. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had 100% compliance with that last year. We were not we were not in any discussions with people insisting otherwise. In the court, I think, um, but, just to say that um, all of the school buildings, we have um, quite a few extra masks. And if kids broke a mask or if they were soiled or wet or simply forgot, um, they came to the health office and, and staff were very good about directing them to come down and get one. And Jared's making sure we're well stocked again. <laughs> Still. <laughs> right. But one point of clarification that we didn't mention, we will be insisting on masks on the school buses. Um, that's a given as well. And that's addressed in your reopening. It is, yes. Return to school. Yes. Yep. Protocols. Okay. Um, if there are no more comments about the policy, we'll revisit this later. I don't know. We're, there's a vote on later. There's, there's a vote on it later, but are we going to vote? Do we change the language right now and vote on an amended, or do we vote on something and then a revised one at our next meeting? Just you could vote on it based on the recommendation made at the meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. So <coughs> Can you share with us your protocols? I certainly I just uh, one more. <clears throat> it's minor, but uh, there's a few more references in the MASC model policy oh, that I think we should insert. Yeah, they have the two we have, and then there's a couple more mass health. So great, thank you. Awesome. There's no no shortage of resources continuing to come out <laughs> every day here for it. So I'll shift gears here to go to the protocol document that uh, is attached to the agenda. And I'm gonna, I was gonna hit these at a very high level, but we can certainly stop at any point, talk on them in more depth. Uh, most of this is gonna sound very familiar. And I think we felt really confident that we were pulling back uh, processes and protocols that we know how to do with great confidence and are very accustomed to and very routine. Um, so clarifying that those routines are uh, essentially largely staying the same, I think, is much of the message this morning. Um, distancing, we are going to be uh, looking to aim for three feet where possible. Uh, we want to just give ourselves that, that room to feel like we spread kids out and have some conscious level of that. Um, we will at lunch be spreading, spacing them, whether at desks or at the cafeteria tables with outdoor eating being the primary plan. Uh, the elementary schools, we've actually got tents sufficient for all of them to eat outside every day that the weather permits. Um, and at the middle and high schools, we've got sufficient tents like we did last year to really um, have as many of them outside as we can and then allow for lots of space for those who are indoors. Hygiene would continue with hand washing and sanitizer routines like we had last year. Cohorting and assigned seating. Uh, we are considering still the elementary classrooms of cohort, which will be important when I get to the quarantine discussion. It minimizes their uh, cross work with other classes in the building. Um, and we also will be uh, assigning seats in classrooms, all classrooms and assigning seats on the bus. The buses will be running at full capacity, which is certainly a change, one of the few changes from last year. Uh, screening, we are going to reinstate the symptom screener um, through Aspen and just a little rationale why Aspen. I know it's a little clunky, but what it does on the back side for the main offices and nurses it populates automatically who has not completed it and allows us a lot of uh, tools to uh, follow up and communicate. It also builds in those automatic reminders that if you miss it, you, you know, kind of get bombarded with an email and a text and such. So that will stay in place as it was last year. Lori? Um, yes. Can I interject about the, uh, the screener? Um, I figured out in like April, how to use a tab 
on Aspen. It specifically works fantastic on the phone where um, there's a tab called forms and you hit it and it's a one question, yes or no. Um, does your child have symptoms as opposed to when you use the full site? I think it's a, Tracy, you'll probably remember like a four step process. It might be worth our while to um, uh, like give a little uh, like a tutoring, like training, or I don't know, I could figure out, I could show you guys how to do it. It saved me an awkward amount of time every morning, like in, in, in the most fabulous way. So just something, I, and I don't think most people know about it. Yeah, no, we can definitely have IT put some okay. direction. And maybe it was great. we can quickly sure, give yeah. a little walk through all yeah. that. Yeah. Thanks, Alexa. Uh, obviously, if there are symptoms, we're going to be asking people to stay home like last year and get tested. <clears throat> Our hope and expectation is the testing process is much more accessible than it was at certain points of last year. And um, negative tests can be acquired fairly quickly and get kids back to school. Um, if there is a positive COVID test, we're going to be working with the nurses and the health leaders. We will be close contact tracing as we have been with a distance of six feet and working through the elementary schools, we will be uh, co quarantining the entire classroom as we did. Um, that was very effective and we know it minimized spread during what we had at Alcott where we had transmission at school. Um, it's important to note, and I think this will minimize quarantine significantly for the older kids. If you are vaccinated, you do not need to quarantine unless you are symptomatic. So that is a big difference going into this year and should really minimize the number of kids out of school. We are moving to the seven day quarantine option that DPH offers coming down from the 10. You'll remember we came down from the 14 last year. We've grown in confidence as to the amount of time uh, required for, for diagnoses to happen. We are shifting because we are full-time in person. Uh, we are pulling back from Zoom access. So quarantine kids will be receiving asynchronous work when they are home. Um, teachers will be prioritizing concepts and workloads so that they're not overwhelmed with the asynchronous work. Again, we expect the older kids not to be highly quarantined because of the vaccine. So part of that is the balance. Uh, if an entire elementary class is quarantined, we will be supporting them remotely um, since they're all at home. If an individual is quarantined, then it still will be asynchronous. We expect to need a day if a whole class is quarantined to distribute devices because you'll remember last year kids had them at home. This year they do not. And we are not planning on distributing them one to one. So we'll need a day to do that turnaround. We are going to participate in the state's free pool testing process. So we're gearing up to go get those routines back and parents should watch for more information. We're aligning with the travel guidance coming from the DPH and CDC, which does not require testing upon return to the state. Transportation, um, we mentioned the mass. Kids will be sitting two at a seat, so distance is much smaller than the six feet we were aiming for at points last year. Windows will be open, buses will be cleaned. We will be assigning seats, which probably is one of our greatest challenges on the bus. Cleaning pro protocols aren't changing from last year. We'll be spraying down every night. High, high volume spaces will get wiped down. We will be having kids wipe their seats in classrooms as we did last year. We're really excited to continue to promote outdoor usage, especially in these early fall months, um, whether it be uh, lunch, but also otherwise. And one of the benefits of unzooming ourselves as teachers aren't so tethered to the laptop and the uh, wireless connection. So I think it will free them up to be outdoors more. <laughs> We are looking to reopen the schools after school student hours to community groups. Um, so that, uh, that process is back in place through the online portal. Um, through Jared's office, they'll be screening that 
groups need to abide by our COVID protocols, wear masks. We're going to watch group size and obviously not let large, large groups in the buildings. But we're glad to make the community use back available again. Visitors, we're trying to find a little progress here. Uh, we, we do want parents to be able to access the main office, nurse's office when needs come up. So that is going to be available. We are not looking for parents to make their way all the way to classrooms and minimize exposures there uh, for lots of good reasons that are both where we were planning on even if COVID had stayed, stayed down. Um, IEP meetings and teacher conferences are going to be held remotely. I think that's a long-term takeaway of COVID is that level of accessibility um, being, being an option going forward. This year, we're going to do it exclusively and uh, continue to talk about whether we stick to exclusively or make it optional once we're out of the COVID era here. We are not going to host large group events inside. We're going to be virtual for the time being. I mean, the back to school and open house events that happen in September are all going to be virtual. So watch for Zoom links to go out on those. Right now, the health leaders are supporting us on outdoor events continuing forward. We're going to take those on a case by case basis and look at the data and the numbers, but we're trying to go forward with little or no restrictions. More to come as those any events come up. Uh, outdoor athletics is the athletic season gets underway. We'll run without restriction. We are making our way just to tidy a little bit of the details up on the indoor athletics, which at the high school is volleyball and cheer. Um, the music program or tie, you know, fine tuning a little bit there. We are desperately eager to get our music programs back on track. It probably took one of the most significant uh, hits of COVID than anything else with the lack of playing. Uh, so it's through safety protocols. We do expect at the secondary level to allow uh, the woodwind and brass instruments to play again and some singing. Um, elementary right now, we're going to hold, go slower there. Those specialists see 400 kids a week in person. So they thought they're going to, you know, not jump right into vocal work uh, immediately until we get a sense of the, the virus. But there'll be lots of great live music going on, which we're excited to bring back. Because as you remember, the music and other specialist programs were remote all year at the elementary schools last year. And finally, we're excited to get students out on field trips, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. We actually have a lot of outdoor trips in the mm -hmm. fall, which we're thrilled to get back on track. And um, obviously, the trips will have to align with our COVID protocols at the time and um, safety measures. So that's where we are right now. Um, it's come together, I think, quite nicely over the last couple of weeks with a lot of input from the health leaders. Mm -hmm. I've been working with the teacher associations and a wonderful collaboration there. Um, and with all of you. Great. Happy to Thank you. Are there questions from school committee members? Alexa and then I, Teresa. I have a quick question. Just I haven't read it anywhere specifically. Will the pooled testing still be of no charge to families and students? The state is sponsoring the pooled testing, the asymptomatic pool testing. So we're excited that they've continued to do that. Thanks. And I had a couple of questions on testing. Um, it might be helpful. I think that many of us were on the receiving end of your child needs to be tested, just like a list of where to go for tests, what do you do, just to make it easier, even from the nurse's perspective, if there was some type of document, where do you go, how long does it take, because I think that there are some rapid PCR tests, there are some regular PCR tests, just to get a sense of how long it's going to be, even our pediatricians went from three days to one day. So that just might be helpful for parents. And then I had a question on the pool testing for vaccinated students in seven through 12. So when I looked at the DESE guidelines, it looks like they're not recommending that, but I, I was unclear on that. Maybe I read it wrong. So are you recommending everyone to go pool testing? Lisa, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, no, I think Tracy, as far as I understood it, they are recommending that everyone okay. will test, even if you're vaccinated. Yep. So um, each building will have a different schedule um, with the nurses on what day they're going to do it. So the nurses um, will let you know. 
I know at the high school, it's gonna be Tuesday and Thursdays. Alexa. Thanks. Um, it might be helpful, and I don't know who might be charged with doing this, um, Lisa, Trisha, Susan. Um, I think it could be confusing to parents and students, parents of vaccinated students and students um, about why they would want to participate in the pooled testing. I was a huge fan of it. Um, all my kids participated, um, but I know in order for it to be really effective, we want, if and even need, high numbers of participation. So I didn't know if there was maybe something we could draft so that to sort of create the compelling case as to why, because I do, and maybe I'm overreacting, I do get concerned that it might be not intuitive to parents as to why they would put their kids in this program if they are in fact vaccinated. That's just a suggestion. We don't have to take it, but I think it could be helpful. I think that's a great segue to offer Trisha Minna to share some of the data she's seeing locally. You have that right in front of you, Trish, because I know you compiled yesterday, the last five or six weeks worth. Yep. Do you have that document? Do you want to share that, Lori? Uh, why don't you start talking and I'll pull it up. Yep. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm the public health nurse for Concord, Lincoln, and Carlisle. And um, Lori's going to be pulling up a document where I um, broke all the cases down that I've been working on since July 1st through yesterday for the three towns and the age breakdown and the vaccination status. I think what's interesting and not really interesting because the under 12s are not vaccinated is the curve of um, positive cases. You know, a year ago it was, it went up as the ages went on. So in Concord, since July 1st, we've had 19 kids under the age of 12 test positive, which is a lot. Um, and as the ages go on, you will see the breakdown. So Concord has had actually, I just got six more cases this morning. We're up to 65 cases since July 1st. Of that, actually, I'm gonna use the number from yesterday because I haven't looked at the vaccination status of my new cases. We've had 59 cases since July 1st. Um, of that, uh, 40, 40 of them were fully vaccinated. 19 were not able to be vaccinated because they were well, so that's that's um, pretty significant. In Carlisle, we've had six cases since July 1st, four fully vaccinated, and in Lincoln, 20 cases since July 1st, and 17 were fully vaccinated. <clears throat> There's my chart. So look at that top line. So you can see the age breakdown of the positive cases per age group and how it's a backwards curve, right? 19 kids then eight and a 12 to 20 and so on and so on. And I will have this updated for next Tuesday for parents because I think this is compelling, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the good news is I've had a couple people with pretty moderate to severe illness um, and uh, the rest have mild symptoms, mild cold-like symptoms. We did have a cluster a couple weeks ago of eight positive kids, all really good friends, all in summer camps, all game together, parents or friends. Of those eight kids, six were asymptomatic, two, six were asymptomatic, two were symptomatic, and it took out, you know, summer camps and whatever. So because this age group, and these were nine, 10, 11 year olds, this age group is vaccinated, um, it's, um, it's of concern going into the school year. So anything we can do to mitigate the risk of the spread of this virus, which they are now equating to the transmissibility of chickenpox, we need to do. So someone said, wearing a mask is not that big of an ask. And I think that's true, right? Is it gonna stop everything? No, but um, given these numbers, especially the vaccinated groups, um, it is uh, showing us that we've got some work to do going into the fall. 
my Lincoln group. See my, uh, got a lot of kids in my 21 to 30 year old um, age group. I'm seeing a lot of those. So um, that's about all I have to share and I'll update those numbers for next Tuesday as well. Thank you, that's helpful, <clears throat> very helpful. And are those numbers going to go back onto um, the district website? Because I did think that was totally helpful last year that we had all of those numbers. Yeah, I, we can do that. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I, I have will, a try. I will try to do that the way I was doing last fall. We we stopped doing it over the winter when the case numbers went up so high, and we just got simply overwhelmed with work and and couldn't pull the numbers together every week, but. I agree. I think it's helpful to have everyone understand the situation. And I have a follow-up question for for a nurse. Uh, uh, out of uh, out of those uh, numbers that you are seeing, uh, people are getting tested and um, numbers are getting reported. Is it because they they had symptoms and they got tested? Um, because that would really speak to the um, usefulness of COVID pool testing in schools. So it was kind of mixed. So some were symptoms and some were contacts. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that the con that many of the contacts were asymptomatic but positive really does speak to the need for pool testing. Since we don't know how infectious those people are who are asymptomatic but positive, we, we really, even DPH is struggling with that. How infectious are those people? Like we're fairly sure that people who are symptomatic and positive are infectious. We just don't know very much about people who are asymptomatic. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate that's that's regardless of vaccination. Mm -hmm. Yep. Status. Yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the, one of the many things that's sobering about this that supports all of your concerns is. When we first heard about breakthrough, we thought those were the outliers. Mm -hmm. Now we know that uh, the opposite is true. That's that's the norm now. Is that the cases are going to be uh, among folks who are vaccinated. <laughs> so I'd like to note that uh, our protocols don't reference vaccination uh, recommendations. Uh, I think we need to be ready for that conversation next week. Can I just say something to that court? Please. I think it's important for people to realize that vaccination does matter. I mean, vaccination is very, very effective and we certainly want people to be vaccinated. Um, DPH says that the percentage of breakthrough cases is 0.23%, so a quarter of a percent. So that's something like one in 400 people who are fully vaccinated will become, you know, can get a breakthrough infection. <laughs> But that's the entire pool of vaccinated people, many of whom are still being very careful about where they go, not going into group settings. So I think a lot of who is vaccinated and gets infected comes down to behavior. Are you going to it crowded indoor settings or aren't you? Um, but of course, school is a more crowded indoor setting. So um, a, a lot of it, I you know, you, you can look at the overall percentage, but then I think that what the data shows us is that people who have been in very close situations like kids playing together or the outbreak in Provincetown where people were in bars and restaurants, it's, it's people's behavior accounts for many of those cases of the breakthrough infections. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and that's just uh, reaffirming our, our approach that uh, this is manageable mm -hmm. through, through our practices. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm hearing you say, Susan. Thank you. Yeah. I've got a couple of others. Yeah. I'm yeah. I mean, we're out. lucky that we live in a community where last year everybody really, really worked hard yeah. to yeah. to try to mitigate it as much as possible, and, and very much appreciation from from our part on that. Uh, I wonder if I might uh, ask us to speak to the reference to school buses at full capacity. Uh, that would imply every seat occupied. I don't think that's what we mean. I, I wonder if you could clarify. 
So, and Jared can hop in. Essentially, we're running our routes as we normally would pre COVID um, with the modifications based on the protocols. But what is different is the seating capacity. Last year, um, we were not putting every child on the bus, and with enormous help from the parent community, we had about 50% or so uh, being transported through you know, parent driving and drop off. This year, we are not. But we're not asking parents for that level of help. We're going to load the buses up as we would in a pre-COVID era and open the windows and put masks on the kids. And so back to normal in terms of capacity with all the COVID measures around it. All right. So the potential is there for full. It yeah. could be okay. full bus. It could be. Okay. A lot of our runs may not be at the capacity because of the length and distance of the run, but it could if it's one of those few that are. And if I can turn to travel, uh, I, I understand that uh, we're following DPH and CDC. Nonetheless, I'm, I'm not comfortable with the declaration that testing is not required after travel. I, I, I'd be more comfortable if this district could recognize an exception and say, uh, yeah, for that trip, if they were at a hot spot or there was an event. Um, uh, and indeed, we are going to expect uh, testing for that group that departed Concord or Carlisle and, and returned. I just want you to have the room to do that without fussing with this simple declarative statement <coughs> that we're not going to do it. Because there could so that, not be exceptions that would give us pause. So that the only reason that makes me think Monday, we do Monday pool testing so with the intent to try to capture that weekend activity or that, you know, maybe even Friday. So it's just something to consider. I know we're hard into the Tuesday, Thursday, but Monday, just get your, uh, I mean, you might not, they might not have, be positive at all, you know. Until Tuesday, Thursday, or, yeah. yes. Right. Yeah. So, I just want you comfortable with the capacity to- Yeah, I'll be honest, it was one of the most challenging things to enforce last year because it's a combination of disclosure and in high level of inconvenience. And I, it, I think it's one of the most challenging to enforce. And that was with state and federally declared hotspots, which no longer exist exactly that way. Certain international travel will have that, but most of the domestic does not. I, I think it would be hard for us to put judgments on hotspots and say, Concord thinks this is a setting you need to get testing back. If there was one protocol we got the most pushback on, it was the testing after travel. Um, so I hear your point, Court. I totally do. I'm just not quite sure how to go about it without state and federal guidance lining up. And, I, and, and, and as was noted before, a lot is, is behavior and, and areas that people choose to, to enter, right? And so you could enter a hot spot in Massachusetts, if you, you know, in a bar just as easily, or you could fly yeah. to a state that has a high um uh, illness you know high, high positivity but you stay in a in a fairly contained environment without a lot of exposure so it's very hard to manage i think it was well, very hard to well, that, that, and that is why public health authorities have much more power than most citizens understand because of the uh, the, the nature of their work uh, and their mandate um, so i simply want to note here that uh, uh, I, I want to make sure this administration has the capacity to uh, uh, make make good judgment calls and not be constrained by our own policies. You, you've got our support. Thank you. Yeah, and I, it's it, I, I see what you're saying, but there's just so many scenarios. And when you know uh, a family can be in Concord and be a much riskier private situation yeah. than a family traveling. Agreed. Um, the plane travels, obviously, but with masks, um, you know, I think. And it goes both ways. I had a number of families say, we literally drove to the house in New Hampshire and yeah. didn't leave, and now we have to test, and we were probably safer than the people, you know, going or moving around Concord. And yeah. we, it's just a lot of variables to figure sure. out. Yeah. And I'm content with what we haven't perhaps emphasized enough here, and that is that we're going to revisit this. Routine. Yes. Every meeting, <laughs> so if we can certainly adjust. Yeah. Yep. Pardon? There's a race. Here.
there's a raised hand. We are not in the middle of public comment right now, um, but I will just remind everybody if you've just joined us that next Tuesday we'll be having a public forum that will give everyone an opportunity to ask questions and engage in um, in more conversation about um, our you know <clears throat> COVID protocols for the return to school. And I also say that anybody who would like to send us questions or comments to the school committee mail address the form on the website, please do so. I think that'd be very helpful so we can be prepared to answer that question or address the comment. Yes, yes. a quick question. Um, uh, Dr. Hunter, what can we do to promote um, students to enroll in the uh, voluntary pool testing at the high school because we have very high um, uh, vaccination rates. Um, and to court's point, you know, people travel, people uh, go places, people go out to restaurants, go out to bars, go to weddings. It's a we're definitely in high uh, seasons of uh, weddings that were put on hold. Uh, there are no travel restrictions anywhere. Um, there is no requirement for unvaccinated people to be tested if they are uh, asymptomatic. So. What can we do to promote students um, uh, to participate? Because that, that is a def uh, definitely a helpful um, uh, 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 protocol. I'll let Lisa join me here in a minute. My first response is making sure they understand if you're vaccinated, you're, it's your get out of quarantine card. I, most of what we heard last year was the resistance to the testing was the fact you might get quarantined. Um, maybe because your pool was, was positive, but even if you were individually positive. Um, so now if you're vaccinated, the only way you end up in quarantine is if you're actually the positive individual. So I think that's a big informational piece we want to be sure we're sharing. Lisa, do you have other things you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree, Lori. And actually, Eva, I was going to reach out to Ariana again. Um, so for those of you that don't know Ava, um, daughter Ariana is a student of ours and she reached out to us hopefully she doesn't mind that I'm giving her a little public shout out here um, in the spring um, asking the nurses if we'd be willing to do a little uh, blurb about the benefits of pool testing and she put a great video together that all of the advisories um, were shown um, in a weekly advisory I'm just trying to promote you know, participation in pool testing. So I would love to reach out to her again um, if she would be interested and maybe we could do an updated version, um, you know, that says, even though you're fully vaccinated, we still want you to pool test. We are mandating testing with the athletes again, like we did last spring, that was very successful. And I think uh, eliminated uh, some issues that we had during the winter season where we were quarantining whole teams. <laughs> um, we went to close contact to contact tracing and testing. And I think that felt like a really productive step forward while we monitored the virus. So. And maybe it doesn't need to be part of this, but if the coaches and the athletic director could remind students who are carpooling, I know it seems like a lot, but to wear a mask when they're together, because I know there's numerous cases of transmission when kids are carpooling from practices and such. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, just one last question. Uh, we had uh, a letter and uh, uh, a pledge, right, uh, sent out uh, beginning of the year. Are we updating that pledge? We haven't talked about that. It's, it's worth discussion. Um, I guess if the committee wants to give me direction that that you think that's valuable, it is some logistical work on our part, but doesn't mean it's not worth it. We want to build that so we can easily account for it. Um, you'll remember last we started with a contract that uh, parents and kids, especially the older kids, signed off on their commitment to the protocols. Um, I'm open to the feedback. From what I've seen, I, look, I did a little looking. Most colleges are not having those pledges anymore because they're pretty much just mess in inside. You know, that's the unless we have other a lot of other behaviors that we're expecting, and it's not yeah. clear cut. Mass wearing. I haven't seen the pledge in a long time. Yeah, we haven't so. pulled it up since last fall. So I couldn't really 
comment today. Why not pull it up and we'll give it a review and then maybe next meeting we could talk decide. about it. The trick is we don't meet again until after school starts. So I'll share it out with you all and then work with Lisa to decide if we'll go forward. I think next week we simply indicate that it's under conversation and under discussion. Yeah, I think it's a much more valuable, in my opinion, to have really strong messaging at each site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Then at the middle school, the and seven, eight, and the high school about how to keep right. the community safe. Right. And that means keeping people in school. And, and right. I think yeah. the symptom screener reminds people of, uh, yeah. of, of just the importance yeah. of everything. Um, yeah. So, you know, we might be able to do a middle ground and, you know, set, push the contract out and then have the advisories give it a review at each, especially middle and high school, so that it's a live document and not just a, mm -hmm. another signature. Mm -hmm. We'll find the middle there as we need to. It'll be worthwhile. Good. Great. Does that put us in a position of equivocating next week and do we want to avoid that? <clears throat> I personally find that a one-time sign-off and it's two weeks, a week later, it's sort of like, you know, I think a, a sort of a constant conversation about if we see problems, <clears throat> picking up on those and, and targeting them and having a... Right. Last year, it was a means of sharing information people have never had before. So much is familiar this year, I think. I think yes. We can include it as a, a reminder but maybe not go through the exercise of the signatures. Yeah. And, yeah, and I also feel like, and I know <clears throat> if there are no consequences, for example, for not signing it, and there are no specific consequences outlined in the document for violating any of the provisions inside of it, I'm not sure if it's a lot of work and a lot of administrative work. To Sarah's point, I think it's, somewhat duplicative with the symptom screener. And to Lori's point, we are all so familiar. And we really had a tremendously high level of compliance. To me, it seems unnecessary. Last year, we could tell people the kids were not going to be in-person learning. We don't have that option. And this year to yeah. tell them they have to be remote. So mm -hmm. yep. if you're looking for a consequence, there is none other than right. chasing people for process. I would agree with that. I'm not really sure, you know, what we would do if we're not gonna if there's no consequences. And I think you're that references change, you know, links to, to CDC and DPH guidelines as those evolve. Yes. You know, which I, I think is I mean, we're not going to need to rework the, the document on on some of those. We may need to revisit the messaging Correct. based on changes there, but at least we have flexibility right. um, to dial up, dial down. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's a good point. Else. Yeah, yeah. The place that I've seen have seen those pledges, um, uh, those contracts in colleges uh, had to do with um, if you were unvaccinated and uh, there was a mandate to uh, for all the students and the faculty to test um, and there were consequences listed then uh, if you did not follow the pro protocol. I'm, 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 uh, I'm looking at the example that I have in front of myself because uh, 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 relationship of my child going to that particular school um, and also uh, consequences for student not masking, um, all students not masking in um, uh, 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 school school setting um, uh, indoors. So it, yes, I, I agree. It, it's uh, completely related to consequences. We don't have those consequences. So, um, uh, 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 and we had such a high compliance. Uh, Shouldn't necessary. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We... Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Yes. Um, I think we will we will be revisiting a lot of this next mm -hmm. week, um, but uh, I think we're in a in a strong place right now. So yep. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So all this will get communicated out uh, starting today, and the building principles will follow up with any other specific building based pieces. Now we are on to a Concord School Committee, the, the capital project, and uh, row fire updates. Great. So I'll start with the uh, with the capital. Uh, so we continue to be in, in great shape. 
hitting all of our, um, our timelines, uh, starting with the well over at Willard. Um, really no updates since I last reported out the last school committee meeting. The phase one is complete. We drilled down to 400 feet, yielding about 35 um, gallons per minute. Phase two right now is being engineered for the bid. We expect that to be done by the end of this month, um, the engineering part, and then we'll bid that out through our uh, people, the people that we're working with. And then that should be back sometime in October. And then we can figure out what needs to be done and if it has to be done when school is not in session or if we can do it when it is in session. So more to come on that. Uh, the Willard uh, boiler exhaust, um, that is still on schedule to be completed before, the, uh, before school starts. So that's really good. The chiller, that is complete. Um, the energy recovery units at Alcott, those are now 90% done. Uh, just the control work, and then we're scheduling some training for the custodians and maintenance staff. So uh, that's excellent. And then the um, the uh, RTUs, rooftop units over at Ripley, um, no update, uh, no change. We're just engineering uh, for the for the bid, and we'll have more information once the grant uh, application uh, gets filled out in mid September. Then the Knox Trail, um, the water line, uh, we have given Weston and Samson, we've been working with them, uh, the PO for the feasibility study. We're continuing to meet with the engineers to discuss the uh, water reclaim system. Uh, so that's still ongoing. Uh, the electrical charging station uh, engineering is in progress. And then um, we did install, lastly, a, a a large fan in the garage, which wasn't necessary, necessarily a capital project, but just wanted to give you an update that that is now complete. The, um, the um, mechanics are extremely happy for that. So any questions on, on capital? Yeah, forgive me because I, I, I don't remember, Jared, on the Ripley, your reference to a grant. Um, yes. So this is the one that is not coming out of town uh, capital budgeting? Correct. So this is the portion that we, so to, to get this grant, we had to do the engineering. It wasn't part of that. So we did budget for that piece. The green community. Green, the, uh, green green community. Community. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So a little bit, uh, a little fire update. Sure. Uh, so um, I sent a, just a little email last night uh, pardon the, the, the late uh, the late, late email. Um, so as of right now, we it is completely demoed. Um, and I'll get you some pictures even today. I'll send some pictures out. The, the demo is completely done. Uh, all the salvage items uh, have been, uh, the salvaged and non-salvaged items have been reviewed by all the teachers. Um, everything has been brought to their temporary space. The teachers have been coming in since last week to get in the, the in getting their temporary spaces uh, all set up. Uh, they're continuing to do that. Uh, everything that is uh, not going to be able to fit in those spaces have been moved back to the pods, uh, and they'll be on site uh, until, until that we can move them back in. Um, we expect, uh, so the, as I said last time, the cabinets are going to be the issue. Um, they were able to get the as-built drawings that we had from 1994. And we think that they can use those. And they came out and they measured uh, the cabinets. All uh, seven of the eight of the, seven of the eight cabinets were deemed um, uh, sal not salvage. So, um, and my understanding is just they build these up in Canada and then they bring them back in. So we think that the construction is going to be done before those cabinets are in. So we will be getting um, we'll be getting temporary cabinets so we can start moving teachers in, hopefully um, in just moving the temporary wall. So we can have a couple classes when they finish with the temporary wall, they can work on two more mm -hmm. and then keep moving. So hopefully getting people in uh, fairly soon. And I'll start having uh, an update on the estimated construction time. I plan on Talking to them this week on that, and if they can get me that, I'll report that out as soon as possible. Um, what else? 
else is there. So I am working, uh, continuing to work with the insurance company on uh, just the tiling, um, it, it's really the estimated loss. Um, and then really the cause, I thought I'd know by now, but I, I haven't uh, gotten this reported, just the cause of what function in the heaters. Um, so we, other than them being somewhat old, we don't know that yet. We do know that the cause of the fire was the heater in the attics. Mm -hmm. um, we will be getting a 35 by 40 tent. Um, in addition, we'll get two other tents for outdoor classroom space, but they'll have a 35 by 40 tent. But my understanding is three walls. We can't get four walls, um, but uh, the three walls hopefully, you know, will keep them uh, keep them warm if we have to go into you know the colder months. Trailers, we're getting two office trailers that should be here, I'm hoping before the end of the first week in September, but that's what they estimated. It's currently on another site and then they're just moving it here when, um, when that's all set. So hopefully we'll have two office trailers that will house uh, the, the eight, uh, eight teachers that were displaced. I think that is, that is it. I, I do have to give, you know, really, um, I have to give a shout out to the custodians. They've been, um, we had a case move out uh, last two Fridays ago. And then that Monday, they, uh, all of the cases, equipment and materials were picked up. And then since that time, our custodians, as well as service master, have been just moving all the stuff all around, doing whatever the teachers have asked of them. So the custodians at the, uh, at the role have been simply amazing. And I'll just piggyback on that with shouting out to the entire staff who are now managing more COVID protocols than we expected along with this condensed space and room reconfigurations and really doing right by kids in the middle of all that. It's going to look like a little city out back by the time we open and uh, we're making it all work. So they're making it work because of their creativity and cooperation. So. So most of the temporary classrooms are gonna be in the cafeteria? There are different spots throughout the building. Angel's done the work to sort of <laughs> survey everywhere. Um, one, was in the, one is in the cafeteria, one in the library. They've repurposed a room, a teacher's um, dining room that isn't mm -hmm. really used for that. The list is, is pretty extensive. Uh, some of them are smaller special education spaces, mm -hmm. so we, get more creative there. Angel's given up her office again um, for one of those to happen. She's literally going to work out of a closet. Uh, so the I, can bring, I can send you the list. She's, no, the reason why I'm asking is for those spaces that don't set up with a projector and a screen, I know <clears throat> most teachers today depend on that very yeah. heavily. Yeah. So do we. Uh, has every teacher had the ability to walk through and say, this is, this yes, is I'm been, gonna need something more than this. Yeah, they've already been in setting up and giving us feedback on what they need and we're responding. I just know that the yeah. supply chain and such, yeah. and it's you can't yeah. just turn around and say, I, I need uh, four or five more projectors no. installed sure. tomorrow. And everybody's gonna be laughing at you because yeah. they're all yeah. book solid. So, yeah. um, you know, just maybe people will need to move around to, to do a audio visual right. Right. Uh, screen work. Yeah, so they've but, been in and working closely with Angel and the building level supports and letting Jared and Peter, anybody who needs to know what they need. Good. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Court, can you walk us through DEI subcommittee? I will do my best. Uh, <clears throat> yes. What I'm going to do is uh, share with you some comments I, I put together uh, that have not been shared with uh, my colleagues yet in regard to what we started last year around the DEI subcommittee, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, I'll simply read you some notes I put together. By way of background, when we started to discuss this in early spring uh, this year, the subcommittee idea, the concept imagined membership and participation by a number of constituents from the schools and the community. Since that time, with the expanded DEI efforts from a number of community groups and the formation of a commission by the Concord Select Board, 
in addition to the multiple initiatives by school-based groups and those led by our administration, a smaller and more targeted subcommittee is in order. So I say that by way of uh, my recommendation, uh, take a, a different shape than we intended. Uh, so let me continue. The school districts, towns, and communities are pursuing a number of DEI initiatives. The schools have been addressing DEI objectives for years, and that's not uh, an overstatement. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not new. And the work has intensified recently, coinciding with a nationwide call to address persistent inequities and their toll on minority groups. In our schools, there are a number of indicators that reveal these inequities. The challenges of meeting diversity hiring goals relative to uh, underachievement, relative underachievement by minority students, and repeated reports of race-related incidents that marginalize Black, Brown, and Asian students, to name a few that are most evident and acute. The school committee is encouraged, I'm speaking for myself here, forgive me, uh, mm -hmm. by the leadership of the administrative team. I, trust my colleagues would strongly agree, including the superintendent and assistant superintendent, principals, DEI director, and the students and faculty who have organized in different ways to address and overcome racism and other forms of discrimination within the school community. It intends to increase its attention and support, uh, that being the school committee. And now a statement about this committee and what it might look like for your consideration only. Mm -hmm. The school committee subcommittee on diversity, equity and inclusion will inform and advise the school committees on how to best meet the district's DEI goals and objectives through policy, budget and engagement with the superintendent of schools. It will report to the school committee quarterly or at least quarterly, you might say, mm -hmm. providing well-informed recommendations for policy and budget with emphasis on how the committees may affect change. Particular attention will be devoted to a greater understanding by the school committee as to quantitative and qualitative measures used to guide district efforts and monitor progress. In addition, it will guide efforts within the school committee to ensure that its members more fully recognize and understand underlying causes of underachievement and systemic discrimination and the, their role and responsibility as educational leaders. The subcommittee will be comprised of three members, Concord, two in number, Carlisle, one. We'll advise and recommend to the school committee its formal charge and mission by, I suggest to you, no later than January of 2022. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you, Court, for, for all of this work and for moving us forward. Um, I, I think you, you really highlighted a, a good focus for the, for, for the committee um, to begin looking at. Sarah, what, what I think it does is it, it expresses the fact that we do not want to uh, distract from the other initiatives underway that are critical. Mm -hmm. We yeah. don't want to enter this space in such a way that uh, we we uh, take up any of that attention or uh, or, or activity elsewhere. Mm -hmm. No, I, I and think, interrupt it. I think you did a good job articulating what is our what is within our purview, really, right? What is our charge, um, and and where should our focus? Uh, where, where could our focus be directed uh, from the beginning, especially with the hiring goals, the underachievement, and, and a look at the incidents um, and how we can align budget policy and engagement in those, in those efforts. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> I personally took a sort of a idea from the select board, the way they're sort of setting up their DEI commission with uh, allowing them to really dig in and, you know, develop their charge, you know, instead of the select board sort of telling this group exactly what they should do, which I don't think they know exactly what they should do. Now, our purview, as you just stated, is more narrow because of our 
um, duties and responsibilities. But policy and budget does give us a fairly broad purview anyway. Um, so th that's why I would like to allow our subcommittee um, really to develop their charge, um, as court stated. And I think that's a good part of the work. Yeah. And it, it might change, but I think um, allowing that sort of deeper thought and collaboration, which we just don't honestly have the time to do at our full committee meetings. Yeah. And I, and I think I want to speak a little bit about the size of the subcommittee. I know that we've gone back and forth about how to, you know, how to, who to involve in these conversations. And these are such critical, uh, broad reaching conversations that impact everybody. And so while we, while our subcommittee starts small, mm -hmm. I would welcome the meetings maybe to be in a in a Zoom format to allow accessibility and uh, an engagement with the community at large through these conversations. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. staff and, and students. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, just the everybody, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Any anyone anyone who who because this this we do need to hear from from different constituents. Yes, this um, isn't a closed this door. This is not a closed door no. conversation. It, it couldn't be and shouldn't be. I want I, I, <laughs> I would encourage uh, a move towards the most transparency uh, possible. And I, I think we could argue and then prove that by virtue of the fact that this is not a group to be formed with, oh, let's say 10 representatives mm -hmm. from X, Y, and Z, we in fact have opened up the, yes. this uh, forum uh, to to everyone and haven't had tiers of participation. It's more inclusive. Yeah. Yes. yes. It, it yeah. can be and should be yeah. by virtue of this. Yeah, I yeah. think so. We're not we're not saying okay, this voice is mm -hmm. right or this mm -hmm. this person, this yeah. group or this representative or any, right. We we really want to. I mean, Zoom this year has really allowed us to 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 access information and and input from so many more members yes. of the of the community um and i think that is a great takeaway um, mm -hmm. and something that makes us stronger going forward uh, i have a quick question uh the meetings of the subcommittee will they be uh, happening during the day or in the evening and uh and and, and a quick follow-up uh it, do we have a plan on um, spreading the word to the parents of the high school students. Often, uh, a lot of emails will go out to the students uh, to to get engaged in um, uh, in uh, areas um, uh, of of school life, uh, and and uh, often parents might not um, uh, have those on the radar. Yeah, I, so, I, from my point of view, every student who can get email. Who that's a we just have to get way to read it, but yes, yes, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, I think if they get emails from the principal that they're supposed to read, um, yeah. that this will be included in that communication yeah. or targeted. I don't think our kindergartners get an email, so right. uh, yeah, they don't. Um, like so, yeah. and I think uh, the question about uh, day or evening, I don't know, and I think maybe we should have mix it up yeah. so that those people who can do something mm -hmm. during the day, yep. but our students obviously couldn't join us during the day. So that that right. sort of eliminates a huge part of our right. um, population. So it might be afternoon, evening thing, in my opinion. Yeah. I'd that's love, to I think once we decide on our members and, 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 and all that, we see what works with the schedules. And, um, and I do think mixing it up a bit yeah. um, would allow just to reach more people again. Yep. Right, that's the goal. So we could alternate, right? Yep. A morning and afternoon and an evening, a morning, afternoon, and evening, or yeah, just eliminating our teachers and students. Right. That's, that's a consideration. That's, that's a consideration. <laughs> so all right. Um so I know when you know everybody didn't have this material in front of them until or this sort of conversation. We didn't really uh, set it up with written materials for everyone. What are people's thoughts about moving forward with the um, makeup of the subcommittee and this approach? Mm -hmm. Mr. Common, and, and having read it, I have now sent it to the school committee Thanks. and to Laurie and her team. Thank you, Court. Any thoughts from our remote participants? 
Um, as I said before, I would love to be on this committee because I do think that this is definitely a passion of mine. I have the time to devote to this. Um, and I do think I have relationships with Concord parents and Boston parents that we could really actively engage our parents with this work. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, I mean, I, just having heard all of this for the first time at first glance without really taking any time to um, review the ideas um, at first glance, it seems fine. I don't really have any, I don't have anything meaningful yet because I just haven't had any time to think about it. But at first glance, I think it sounds good. Uh, I would note that what I share doesn't uh, uh, confine no, no, or no. dictate to this committee uh, at all. No, it sets the table and, uh, and it's a good starting point for. Now we do have on the agenda later in the meeting a vote to appoint um, our members to this uh, committee. Uh, do people feel comfortable with moving it? I'd like to get this group launched as quickly as possible. But if people don't feel comfortable moving forward today, I certainly understand that. Um, and we can also revisit the members or the company, yes, right? The uh, position. Sure. Yeah. If we need it to, or um, based on people's availability or mm -hmm. bandwidth. And, um, do we need to formally form the subcommittee? Do we need to vote on yes. formally yes. forming the subcommittee as yes. well? Yes, it, right? it could be absent a formal charge. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do need to. Do we have one more action item? If people are comfortable Correct. moving forward right. with that. I would hope we move forward with a Concord and a Carlisle rep, and I would recommend leaving one seat open until all members of the school committee have been consulted on this. Okay, okay. understood. That, yep. that's, a, that's a good way to proceed. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you, Clark. Um, so we'll move on through the rest of our items and we'll add another vote to form the committee during our action items. Is mm -hmm. that that's correct. agreeable? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so Cynthia, would you like to take us through the Concord sure. Finance Committee guideline request? So perhaps somebody could share it. I, who can share? Sharon's ready to share. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so if other members of the committee don't have this at their fingertips, uh, <clears throat> every year the Concord, <clears throat> excuse me, Concord Finance Committee sends us a guidelines request. And if you've ever seen a prior uh, guidelines requests, this is quite a bit shorter than prior requests. Usually they have quite a bit of detail on specific, not line items, but sometimes they might be those. So they have, um, uh, I would say, reduced this to a much more open um, sort of request. And I think they're depending on the receivers to sort of uh, understand that they're looking for the top three to five strategic issues challenges or opportunities that the Concord or Concord Carlisle schools are facing. And so I myself had a trouble with coming up with those if, uh, um, so perhaps in a future meeting, you can report on what you think those are um, looking out five years. One thing I think is not difficult to do is are these projections. Um, so they're looking at projections for the next five fiscal years. So going up to 27, I'm doing that now. Um, we have just completed two contracts with our uh, teachers and that have specific, so doing two years worth of projections is gonna be, I would think fairly easy. Um, and then our smarter, smaller bargaining units, we have a similar, maybe we have a couple of one years. Um, we could do that and then doing it with our operating budgets. You can let us know the ease or difficulty of doing that. We've never done five-year projections, obviously. So that's maybe for a conversation later. Yeah, sure. Though I thought, I looked at the deadlines and I think we need to have something in front of us that we can do an analysis on um, at the end of September meeting. But it would probably be good to have a conversation before that if you're thinking some of this work is more difficult than I we anticipated to be. The other thing that would be a change or an addition is doing a five-year capital plan at the region. 
um, which they're requesting. I don't know, it doesn't have to be packed with stuff. Right. We have a relatively new building, um, but I know uh, we do have uh, needs and wants um, on the campus itself. Um, so maybe we could just sort of look at what we think those are and perhaps sort of show us um, in the community what we might have done over the last two years to improve the campus and the costs associated with that. Um, <clears throat> so those are my two cents having read this document a couple of times. Um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? If I may just add to that. Sure. So the good thing is, is we met with um, the chair of Parashaw, the guidelines, as well as Kerry uh, LaFleur. Uh, Stephen Crane was also involved. The good thing is, is pretty much everything that they asked for, this is definitely a shortened version. Mm -hmm. We do in what we call our fall budget book, which we're going to still continue to do. So we're going to still produce our fall budget book, get more information than they want because it just builds on, you know, the, the spring budget book. Um, and then such as, you know, we, we give five years, we give 20 years worth of OPEC, what we know. We mm -hmm. give the five-year capital plan at CPS. Mm -hmm. um, we give the budget updates in FY21 versus FY22 actuals versus budgeted. Um, we even give, you know, uh, busing, uh, the, the uh, year and date of buses, the mileage, everything. Um, so... While the, the difference this year will be giving the five-year projections, mm -hmm. I've already done it in a way. Um, they want it very high level. They do not want, you know, to the penny. They want, you know, what is the estimates? Um, so what they're looking for on or around October 14th, we'll get you that information well beforehand. It's sort of a, um, a much short, uh, shortened version of my regular presentation with the couple added, you know, such as the five years and the five year capital plan at the high school. So uh, I do feel this is very manageable. Uh, we will certainly uh, let you know sooner than later if there are going to be any holdups or any issues. We are still in the process of closing out FY21. And until we close out, we really can't get started on, um, on some of the big stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so we should, we should be closed out, I'm hoping before the end of the month, um, which is which is normal. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I welcome this to be future agenda items, but I do not see an issue um, with this, as well as the four or five big uh, buckets that they want to see things broken up on. Right, and I think it's um, it's because of the contracts, and, and we know what they are. I think it's important to show that flow of teachers in and what we think teachers out and I mean the, the date of hire is what longevity is based on correct date of hire yes yes, yes. so we know everybody who's in the system their date of hire and when they're going to be coming 10 years and you know, we can say okay we project two to go out um of the 30 year that you know whatever however we want to do it but you know with our current staff i think we can because with those longevity numbers are significant and we need to show the community what it will look like in FY27 as best we can, <laughs> FY23, 24. I mean, it'll all be built on a lot of assumptions. Um, well, no, just we yeah, need to, yeah. yeah. And as long as we can just show the assumptions, we're probably gonna be projecting higher than actual just because usually there's more than anticipated and we're gonna be conservative right. on that, but yeah. We'll just show them the data based on blah, 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 you know? I would echo what both of you are saying in regard to the the assumptions. Mm -hmm. The numbers are going to speak for themselves. The uh, the assumptions, teachers in, teachers out, um, for example, mm -hmm. replacements, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what retention uh, might be, and so on, and what might happen post uh, current contracts mm -hmm. uh, if we have to look at five years is again going to be assumption driven. So and pull, uh, that, that narrative is going to be critical. I think, yeah. And us. anybody, you know, the spreadsheet gets put in 2% BOA, 2.5, 2.5. Maybe five. school in there in the five years. Yeah. <laughs> Wishful this one. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that'd be good. That, that's the plan. Yeah, that's yes, the plan. that is the plan <laughs> with that. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? Anybody remote? Do you have anything to add no. or question? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, then I think we can move on to new. Where are we? Action. 
uh, board approval. approval process. There we go. Jared, can, so, you, can yeah. you give us a little? So um, I will say the transition to the new members has been seamless. We we have um, so right now. So the, the we require three signatures at CPS out of the five to um, to pass forward to the town. And then at the high school, school committee signatures, we require four. Uh, it's customarily then, you know, three from Concord, one from Carlisle. What we do right now is we have been sending it out to the entire committee. Uh, in Concord, um, uh, Court, Cynthia, and Tracy have been responding. Um, and then at the high school, it's been Court, Cynthia, Tracy, and both Eva and you, Sarah, have been responding. Yeah, because um, we hadn't quite figured so out. So that is the one we didn't uh, area that. if you yeah. want to designate mm -hmm. uh, that to the both of you. I think, um, especially the new members, uh, I think they have a good grasp now of what they're looking for, uh, what, what they're supposed to be looking for. Um, and, you know, people can answer, ask them questions, <laughs> and I know that the team has been responsive. So um, do you want more clarity? What are you looking for? I think we just wanted to give an opportunity for anybody to ask any questions Great. about the process. Um, and also it, just to flag that from the region side, when we seated the new committee last time, we actually didn't appoint our yep. uh, signatures. Right. So I just, we just needed to, there was some housekeeping. Right. Yep. So does anybody have questions about the process? We're we're all up to up to speed now. Okay. Good. Maybe, um, maybe this is just rhetoric, but I, I want to share it anyway. Um, we uh, have a responsibility as, as stewards of community funds for schools, and as such, we ask questions. Uh, and I continue to be uh, very very pleased and impressed with the uh, the ease and facility with which your staff will respond to those questions. Um, or or forward it to somebody. Um, uh, I think I speak for my colleagues when I say we don't want to nitpick, but we do want to understand. Um, and uh, your response has been nothing short of exceptional. So thank you. Yeah. And, and just to clarify too, sort of how the process works just very quickly. So there are a number of eyes that see this before you get to it. It's from the originator, who could be a secretary, to the principal approving it, to um, our accountant um, approving it, then to me, and then it goes to Dr. Hunter, and then it goes to you. So there are four or five always sets of eyes on this. So um, there's really nothing we shouldn't be able to answer. So, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? <clears throat> so last year, of course, these weren't sent to the whole committee, and I recognize that we appoint someone, will or we appoint a group to approve the warrants. Um, even if we move forward in approving said group, will we still be will we still make it our norm, I guess, to send to the whole committee so that we all review or will that sort of go away? Everybody should see it. Okay, great. Awesome. Thanks. Everybody at the school committee should see it. And, and that, okay. has, that has a number of uh, uh, purposes. One is we all stay equally informed, but two, should one of the approved drop off the radar and Jared's in a hurry, he can reach out to the other committee members. Correct. Yep. Oh, great. I was hoping that. I just didn't know because, you know, it's only my second year. And this is the benefit of having moved to an electronic process because it wasn't ago we were handing people folders at meetings and trying to get people in and now you all have accessibility to it, which is excellent. Great. And one last thing to clarify, my apologies. I think you all know this. AP accounts payable, we can hold up checks. We do not send anything to the town or, or mail any checks until we get the three or the four signatures. Mm -hmm. Payroll, we cannot hold up unless it's a supplement. Um, so just to let you know, and we usually get it out to you, you know, I know it went out yesterday for Thursday. So we give usually give 40, 48 to 72 hours, but just wanted to clarify that in case there was any questions on that. And I will say as a new member, just jumping on, Kristen was very helpful uh, meeting with me via Zoom and just explaining the process. So I think that's what's helped it go a little bit more quickly. So thank you to Kristen. Kristen Vasco, she's our company. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Okay. So on to action items, and we have a few more. I'd like to, following on Jared's, I'd like to add a vote to appoint our signers, our warrant signers from the region. Um, we can take care of that. Um, and so Jared, just remind me. Yep. Who um, so right now at Concord, uh, we have uh, Tracy, Court, and Cynthia. Mm -hmm. And then, um, same three for the region okay. and then between you and Eva. Yeah. Um, so Eva, if you're if you're happy to continue doing that, that would be fantastic. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And I just wanted to add, Chris has been very, very responsive um, uh, with any questions that I had regarding uh, warrants. Thank you. Great. So we have a motion to accept. Cynthia, Tracy, Court, and Eva as the warrant signers for the region. So moved. I'll second. Hey, roll call. Anderson, aye for both. Booth, aye for both. Marano, aye for both. Mustafi, aye for region. Rainy, aye for region. <laughs> Wilson for region. Thank you. Okay, so that one. And now we can go to the vote to approve the change in the CCACE advisory board membership. I can speak to this briefly. Yep. Uh, Jill Weintraub, director of adult and community education has let you know that Ron Bernard has resigned his seat. And according to the bylaws, uh, the regional school committee is expected to appoint a successor for the remainder of the term. Uh, Jill and the current chair have named Barbara McGee, a uh, local resident and uh, known retired mm -hmm. Concord public school teacher um, to the, I believe it's a year that's left. So that's their nomination. And with your vote there, <laughs> Barbara and she'll slide right in. Good. Great. I'll entertain a motion to appoint Barbara McGee to the remainder of Ron Bernard's term on the Adult and Community Education Advisory Committee. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Okay, roll call. Uh, I'd like to speak to it. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, first, uh, I want to express uh, our thanks to Mr. Bernard. Um, this is uh, his second term. I think he's been uh, with the committee for uh, probably fully five years. Uh, secondly, uh, over many decades, uh, it's really been demonstrated that having uh, people familiar with Concord and Concord Carlisle classroom activities, i.e. teachers and mm -hmm. retired teachers, have been uh, uh, really beneficial to the advisory committee. Uh, third, just for new members, I, I want to note that uh, the advisory board was initially set up uh, decades ago to advise the school committee on matters of community education policy. Okay. Uh, but uh, in point of fact, that's really uh, not necessary uh, right now. This has been a program that's been functioning for over half a century. Uh, and so the uh, committee, it's not a board, it's a committee uh, just to be particular here, okay. uh, really advises uh, and works with the director and her staff on uh, matters of program and community outreach. Um, I don't think that re requires any uh, shifts or change on our part, but just as a practical matter, know that they're not routinely advising us on mm -hmm. matters of policy. Uh, and then finally, I believe the terms are three years uh, following the, the norm or the practice of the two terms and then try to rotate off uh, such that uh, we might see uh, other uh, recommendations for appointments mm -hmm. in the future because uh, uh, I know Jill is fully on board and uh, well, well versed in, in uh, how it works in the district. I think this is what year five for, for Jill, the program's going. I think you would echo this, Kristen, very, 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 very smoothly and made, made the COVID transition uh, mm -hmm. remarkably yes. well. Yes. Another environment where Zoom will be a long term plus. <laughs> no, they're not giving it up. No. Uh, their, their outreach, yes. uh, their footprint has gotten bigger, yeah. not yeah. smaller. Yeah. And so, uh, 
And again, uh, go back to what I said first, uh, our thanks to uh, Mr. Bernard yes. for his service. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, and, and thanks to Barbara McGee for yes. taking up uh, yeah. the charge. Yeah, great. So any other further discussion? All right, roll call. Anderson, I. Booth, I. Morano, I. Mustafi, I. Rainy, I. Is it it's for regional. both? It's for regional. regional? That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Wilson, I. Okay. Great. And then we have now a vote to approve face covering policy EBCFA um, with the modifications as noted earlier, the details about types of masks and updated references to align with MASC. Correct. Okay. Move, move to accept. That's recommended with those changes. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? I don't see any. Nope. Okay. Great. Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Morano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainy, I for both. And Wilson for region. So now I'd like to insert a vote to form a sub a DEI subcommittee before I'm voting on makes sense. <laughs> members. Um, as discussed earlier, uh, and the subcommittee will formally formally form a charge and, and it's, uh, an outline its meeting plans and all of that stuff. Um, and, and we'll hopefully, hopefully get started working this Form a recommended charge. Yes, from yes. Yeah, to bring back. Yeah. Um, that we hope to get moving as quickly as possible. Um, so, is there a motion to form a DEI subcommittee? Uh, I, I move to uh, form a school committee, uh, DEI subcommittee, uh, serving both districts, both committees. Good. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Discussion? No. Many thanks to everyone. Very important work. Yep. <clears throat> Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Morano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rainy, I for both. Wilson for region. With that, we can uh, move to appoint DEI subcommittee members. However, as noted, we don't have all members in attendance. And so I might propose that the the actual the seating is for the for Concord as sort of court indicated mm -hmm. for Concord school committee appoints a member mm -hmm. technically and uh, and the region appoints one and one right yes that ends us with two and one we do need somebody from Carlisle so right yeah the region would need to appoint somebody from Carlisle so <clears throat> would I be too forward in uh, moving that the DEI subcommittee uh, include for the present time for the region, Sarah Wilson, for the Concord Public Schools and School Committee, Tracy Morano, with the third seat, a Concord seat to be determined in the future. Very good. I'd like to determine that in the next meeting. Um, yes, I like it. Putting you on the spot, Tracy and Sarah. But I think everybody is well suited to this work, but I mm. think that you bring the the energy and the commitment that's going to be necessary. I'll, I'll echo what Cynthia said. Uh, this is important, and mm. it's going to require the, this extra effort that a subcommittee can uh, perform for the school committee and for the districts. Yes, very important. I'm happy to do it. Yep. Do we have a motion? Do we get a second? We do not have a second. I'll second that. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, discussion? Tracy has 
very nicely uh, accepted. I I accept uh, and, Good. Uh, and I'm very excited to get started on this work. And we will note that, you know, that at the next meeting, mm -hmm. we will vote. We want to have the committee formed as quickly as possible in its entirety. Yes. Yes. On the 31st, we will. Good. Got the last one. Okay. Um, so we're giving you a broad, <laughs> very broad uh, um, you know, charge or not charge, which I think is, is most healthy for you, for us going forward. So you can really sort of dig in, talk, and yeah. roll around with a lot of things that we've been discussing as individuals and as a committee, and, and see where that takes you. Great. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to we're in the discussion now. Put uh, uh, Kristen and Lori uh, on the spot and say uh, we uh, would be happy to hear any any thoughts or opinions you have on this. Uh, even though it's school committee. Uh, mm -hmm. Subcommittee, it's a committee that's going to be working with and through you uh, mm -hmm. and folks. So we hope that you and other have, staff as well. Uh, yeah, we I mean, you, as uh, are in discussed with us and can help us shape it as we, mm -hmm. as we move forward. I like the direction you went because it feels like it's going to morph to the needs we have that aren't getting done elsewhere or be a little bit of a spoke to all of those needs. Yes. So I think we. I liked what I heard today, and then we can work with where your priorities will be the discussion and where you want to put the time first. Um, but it will be a nice hub for all the work that's going on because mm -hmm. we're also about to start a CCTA group as part of the contract we just bargained, and mm -hmm. the teachers work already with Kristen and Andrew. And I think you know there'll be a nice, nice place we can share out information mm -hmm. and then hear the school committee support on all this work is so critical to the to the um to not only the direction but also to the the importance that we're giving it just because we yeah. are going to get challenged along the way and questioned along the way and Good. i think we need to show that That's it's what I a, a yep. priority no matter what mm -hmm. and um yeah no i'm excited for those discussions anything you want to add yeah i would just add there are five communities running mm -hmm. uh, with educators uh, working on different aspects of what we're doing and we have to support the work of you know making our literature selection more diverse, uh, our hiring and so forth. So happy to do all that. And I think uh, your work and our work will be very informed by our audit that we're doing this year. Um, so we hope to start that in October and uh, have results in January and February. Good. Great. Yeah. All the Got more a reason to get yeah, there. No shortage of topic. Okay. Um, are we ready to vote? Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Marie, I for both. Kristen, I for both. Mustafa, I for region. Rainy, I for both. And Wilson for region. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Thank you. 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 And we have the signers. No, we did the signers. We did the signers. We did them before the CCAC. We did the mask with the modification. We did the committee and the committee members. I have no notes of other action items that we need to address today. So with that, I believe I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Can we get a second or just one stay? <laughs> second. I get <laughs> roll call. No, oh, yep. Anderson, I for both. I for both. Murano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Randy, I for both. And Wilson for region. Thank you very much. Yes. All right. Have a great day and see you uh, next Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Correct. Bye, guys. Thank you. All meeting. Mm -hmm. Webinar. Thank you. All right.